John Cole for coming today. Are you a college or high school student? Or? Uh, high school. High school. What, which is what year? Uh, senior. Senior. Right. Graduating on Friday. All right. Is radio astronomy in your uh, career future? <laughs> um,
feed horns, literally made out of cans of coffee, uh, that just so happened to be tuned for 1.4 gigahertz. Uh, then we attached a uh, low noise amplifier and a bandpass filter to the feed horns, and then uh, several line amplifiers in the coax to get to the computers. Uh, we used uh, two air spies for the actual digitizing and a pair of GPS plugs for making it stable. Uh, so the dishes we have we had to go find them. We put out a, an ad on Front Porch Forum for uh, free used dishes that people just didn't want to have. We got lots of small uh, gray ones, uh, but we also managed to find the two dishes that we had that we used. We had to go and disassemble those on site and move them back to my house. Uh, the eight foot was in pretty good condition and we were actually able to just pick it up, put it on the roof of the car, strap it down. But the 10 footer we had to split in half because it was wider and would be more difficult to navigate. Uh, so there's pictures of this is getting the dishes part. And then we put uh, them on mounts that we made for specifically for the dishes using uh, four by fours. And this mount used the uh, metal pipe from one of the antennas. We <coughs> cut it off at the ground. The other one used another four by four because the, the other antenna this pipe is filled with concrete, so. So, then tie downs, so it doesn't pull over. And this thing here is actually the uh, original mount that the dishes were mounted on, on top of the pipe. And we, use, we modified that so that it can point in multiple directions instead of just the equator. So that that feed horn up there, here's a close up. It's literally just two coffee cans soldered together. Um, we used uh, this article from ARRL for how to get the dimensions right, and we were really lucky that we didn't have to actually trim the cans. They were just the right dimensions. So, yeah. Uh, the picture's a bit dark, but right here there's a metal plate that can slide back and forth. <coughs> and there's a uh, hand connector uh, going through it into the can with a <coughs> wire. And a cable goes off to the other side. Uh, with the current setup, there's that. It doesn't go straight to a cable, it has the Allen has to right on it, but yeah. So here's a spreadsheet showing our various attempts at getting the right dimensions. Once we got the feed horns working, we decided to figure out how much of a uh, angle what the bandwidth was. So here's uh, some data. Um, and when we found it on, on the telescopes, and they work. We were able to actually see hydrogen. That was one of the reasons why we uh, chose that uh, frequency range, because hydrogen was there to be able to easily see it. Uh, sorry about no 
labels on the x and y axes. Uh, so can you give us a rough idea how many dB out of the noise that was? Um, let's see. This bottom row is negative 55 dBm and the no, wait, no negative 60 and then negative 55 dBm. So um, immediately. Yeah. 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 Um, the colors are because this was actually 12 different measurements recorded over the course of an hour. Uh, and it, they're colored going through the color wheel from red to green to blue and back to purple. Time to go find some 10 foot dishes in one more county. Yeah. So, <coughs> yeah. so, in order to get this, we used a couple of programs. Used AstroSpy for that to get that data. That's part of the AirSpy uh, uh, SDR Sharp software package. It uh, integrates around the hydrogen line and produces a Fourier transform of the signal. Uh, and that can be exported as either a screenshot or a Excel. Uh, Spreadsheet. We also use SDR Sharp for recording uh, <coughs> data directly from the antenna as wave files. And in order to, during our first attempts to create a uh, strip chart recorder for testing interferometry, we use, in order to go from SDR Sharp to Radio Skypipe, we had to use a digital um, audio cable to pipe the signal directly because SkyPipe uses an audio input. So the main reason why I'm mentioning here recording IO data is because the original idea for this project was to do it wirelessly, as in recording data at each antenna and then processing it later. So I needed to be able to record data. Uh, but the thing with the, the way that SDR Sharp records that is it doesn't give you much information about specifics of when and where the antenna was. Uh, so I uh, <coughs> I've been creating a file standard for being able to record that. It's got the IQ data uh, in it, but it also has information about uh, who took the data, uh, where it is, when it is, uh, where you're looking, and information on various clocks and Observing frequencies that were used so that it could be properly correlated. Comment? Yes. There is a standard out. Why do 49? Yeah. Wait, there was a Vista 49? Vita. Okay. Sec Vita? Vita. Vita 49. Okay. All right. That was invented to do what okay. you reinvented. Okay. I didn't find that, but thank you. VITI. Thank you. So, um, because we had the same problem. Yeah. So basically, once again, same thing. Um, and that original graph that I showed you with the multicolored lines, <coughs> I found that the spreadsheet programs that I had were too slow to process the amount of data that it was. It, like, press the button, wait 30 seconds, have a graph. Not exactly the best program. So I ended up having to create my own spreadsheet program with a lot of a few custom features, such as being able to actually open wave files, which are typically an audio file. So most spreadsheet programs wouldn't exactly be that interested in them. There's some screenshots, um, 
And while I wasn't able to actually do proper interferometry with the antennas, I was able to simulate what it would look like and this I use on uh, non free online graphic calculator called Desmos. And that's not actually a real world representation that's tuned for uh, fitting very different uh, low widths into the screen for that. Yeah. So in conclusion, this is a long-term project that I'm still working on. Uh, I was surprised at how quickly we could actually uh, view the hydrogen line, but interferometry still something we're working on. Um, true 1.4 gigahertz bit fast for recording data, but I still think that at least for lower wave, higher wavelength, lower frequencies, it could still be done with pre-recording and then mixing data. And those drones I mentioned, yeah, not exactly <coughs> that good of an idea. Uh, pretty long way off. Uh, yeah, and acknowledgments and yeah, questions? Yes. You showed, I think, what was the receiver you were using, AirSpy or something? Yes. <clears throat> have you, with external reference? Yes. Have you actually tried to play with those yet? Um, a bit. The <coughs> question of interest would be, with a known signal into both of them, and disconnecting and reconnecting the external reference, do they always come up both coherent and the right print? Correct phase. Um, I have not tried that yet, so something to yeah check. Yeah. <laughs> this has been a question. Some other questions. Yes. Are you trying to say new radio software for this project at all? Um, no. I I was kind of just wandering around in the dark, to be honest. Uh, just. If I couldn't find it in with a quick web search, and I tried to work with what I had, so uh, and didn't have any Linux computers to run. Don't you know, need Linux. Okay. Yeah. Well, that way, you hold your hand. Life will be quick. They uh, and with the GNU radio, they actually have where you can put it on a pen drive and just boot up on that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anything else? It was an impressive amount of work you did to get the telescope up and, and working. That was really yeah. nice. The what what when it goes to an audio um, signal, what bandwidth does it limit you to for, for what, if it goes through that audio cable? How does that work? For what what will the bandwidth does that come out of it? Um. Technically, it's not a physical audio cable. It's just a piece of software that takes uh, a signal pumped into the computer's audio out and plugs it back into the audio in. Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> but no, I do not know the specifications off the top of my head. Phrased differently, what is the was the uh, sample rate that you had on SkyPipe? Um, once again, do not know off the top of my head. Okay. So, yeah. Got lots of time. Any questions? Did you have fun? <laughs> yes. Do you have any questions? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you, so, you, hi. In what format were you going to try to gather the data at the antenna? Um, I was trying to gather them to uh, record the data as uh, IQ data, so the actual waveform. And I, with the software I had, I was it was being recorded as a wave file with the I and Q data being different channels. So. Um,
if you're going to have, sorry, oh, raise yes. my hand. Uh, if you're going to be having the two drones be autonomous, they're yeah. flying around. Uh, GPS, at least most of the systems that you can easily work with, are not that accurate. They're accurate to about, well, if you're lucky, to within about uh, 10 or 20 feet. But yeah. more, you know, the claim is, eh, if it's under, uh, you know, 10 meters, then uh, yeah, you're you're close enough. Uh, you're here looking at an interferometer and the wavelength of the frequency you're after yeah. is a lot less than that. Yeah, uh, that's one of the reasons why saying. we ditched the idea of putting them on drones. Not okay. drones, because the, the sizes of the antennas required to actually have the drones be able to lift off was uh, not only <coughs> having really short wavelengths that the drones might not be able to place themselves at, but also uh, the, the recording speed necessary in order to capture it at the drone was limiting as well. But yeah, you need really good time stamping as well because yeah. when you get up 30, 40 feet, the wind's blowing up there. Drones don't stand still. No, they don't. Yeah, the higher the big sail of an antenna on there, it would be well, the higher yeah, the frequency you get, the more it acts. Everybody does that. Uh, we did some, in the microwave business, we do what they call path loss testing. We test the path to see what the loss is on it. And one time we had one of the radio engineers decide to use helicopters instead of fixed them on the ground. Mm. They got the antennas up in the air and they were doing fine except the motion of the helicopter was greater than what we were looking for in variation of the data. <laughs> <laughs> so the drones may have the same problem. The yeah. stability of the yeah. platform may not be that good. We use so the directional you, antenna and big guys. Uh, yes, again. If, if, if you're giving up on, on the drones, what is what are you going to do for a movable uh, platform? Have you kind of decided on that yet? Um, the mounts that I built are quite movable. You just need a couple people in a row. But uh, you could, they could be modified for uh, for wheels or some other method just say, transportation. You need to get somebody to donate a couple old trailers to you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and put them on there and they move yeah. What, what sort of baseline spacing are you trying to achieve? I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, currently, they're at uh, about 40 meters apart. Uh, that's just limited by the size of my yard and how much cable we have. So, uh, in a perfect yeah. world, what would you like to do? In a perfect world, being able to record data at each antenna would allow you to have whatever baseline right. you wanted. That's how the big boys do. Yeah. But that's why you need a real good time stamp. Yeah. You, you had mentioned possibly going to a higher frequency where the antennas would get smaller. Yeah. But if you double your frequency, you also double the accuracy required on your time stamps. Yeah. So well, that gets to be a... Yeah. Chasing your tail operation, you aren't careful. The other thing, too, is flux falls off according to the flux law, and you lose a lot of energy you go up. Yeah. Uh, Sad, but true. Yeah. What about you just using the drone for delivery system? That would be pizzas? <laughs> yes, uh, that might work. Uh, Bring them out to Amazon. Uh, once again, the size required in order to uh, be able to move, lift and move an antenna using drones. Even you need a fleet of drones where you need really, really small antennas, which means A, uh, low, low gain, B, really high frequency. So, yes. Hey John, how did you uh, measure your uh, off-axis uh, antenna performance? Uh, we just had the antenna on a uh, tripod and we had a, another antenna far away and we just rotated it and watched, uh, we've got a network analyzer and... How far away? Yeah. Um, the data that was on the graph, I believe that was from mm, 
about from here to you, but you've um, got to watch out. Yeah, yeah. That, you're in, you're in the near field. Still. Yeah. Well, the antenna, the antenna dish is in the near field. I'm sorry. You're looking to see how much of the dish you're going to eliminate. So, but that was just to feed you. But you can't make right a real good judgment the whole dish. Back here in the near field. Okay. You, you, you like point source or you get two key squared over lambda, and you have to take both dishes. Now, what people sometimes will do is they'll use a low gain antenna at one end, and they ignore that. But if you have two dishes looking at each other, you have to calculate the far field limit for each one, and then you add those together. And so you, like for example, we have a 21 meter dish at 1400 meg. Our far field is four kilometers. You can get you can get really close though with the very second question. Yeah. Well, that's a near field. Yeah. No, no, I'm not talking about it's doing far field. The simplest method to get a pattern on an antenna for radio astronomy is look at the sun oh. yeah. and let it let the Earth do yeah. 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 and you'll see the slope of that, that pattern on the antenna. Yeah, and you'll get nice side lobes too because it's such so strong you'll even yeah. see. Yeah. The side look pattern on yeah. the dish. Um, the data that was shown was actually not for the dish and antenna system. It was just only for the feed horn. Oh, okay, okay, so the feed horn is small enough. Yeah. You don't have to be a ridiculous distance yeah. apart to make yeah. get an idea of the pattern. Yeah. I believe I saw a hand over near the door, maybe. Uh, okay. No. Uh, from the photograph. Page 83. It looks like you've got coax between the output of the feed horn going to a preamp fire. Um, I don't have the thing in front of me. Where your preamp fire is directly to the feed horn. Yeah. Uh, that is the same picture that I have up on the presentation, and I mentioned that the that picture was before we actually mounted right. the LNA and band pass holder and all that stuff to the feed horn. Okay. The current system is directly into it. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so we've got 15 minutes. Yes. Is your end result trying to do imaging or what is your final goal, I guess, when you're... Um, mainly I'm just trying to get the wireless interferometry to work, but uh, yeah, imaging is one of those main goals. But you do want to, you want to incorporate wireless in the yeah. interferometry. What's your next step? Um, probably figuring out the bugs that are causing the wired interferometry to not work. <laughs> so, yeah. That's the first step. Martin Riley, I think, did a thing on a wireless interferometry using microwave links back in the 50s. And I think it might be in the book, the John Grell Bank book. I forget the name of it. Lowell's book. Anybody remember? I've got that. We've got that. <clears throat> yeah, that's, yeah. Okay. The, the early interferometry at Cambridge, when they got to wider spacing, they actually uh, transmitted the LO of the receiver from one side to the other with a radio link and the IF signal back by another radio link. Hmm. They went over a few kilometers that way. Yeah. Okay. Well, they also did something clever with the cancellation of, fit of phase drift with that, too, as I remember. Speaking of feeds, Mr. Feed, what did you think of his feed horn? I walked in late last and he ratted me out. <laughs> <laughs> Can you bring up the picture of your two coffee cans? Because <clears throat> you're, you're, you're the only one who missed. Did you put the lid back on the front? Yeah, so right up. Hey, I, I love the guy. He's going the right way. It looks fine. Yeah. And I noticed that the pro is fat on the end. <laughs> because it needs that. And, uh, and the reason why is it reduces the SWR of the probe system, the can, the whole cylindrical waveguide, it makes it perform better. Yeah. That's a good Well, yes, yeah, that's another benefit. Okay. Okay. The little tweak there. Increase the bandwidth. Yeah, they're not really worried about the bandwidth. What they're really worried about is just getting a good VSWR notch. Because any energy that's reflected in the system is energy that's not delivered to the pre. So you want to stop the reflection. And, uh, if you have uh, you know, a dB of loss because of bad VSWR, that's another dB on your noise temperature. Yeah. So it actually adds directly to your system noise temperature. So you want to, you want to avoid that. What's the length of your can? If you got LG over 4, what's the um, length of the can? 
Information from was for 2400 megahertz. So, how did you, what did you go through to get that, scale that down to uh, uh, hydrogen? Basically, just kind of double the dimensions. Uh, actually, the article included equations for uh, signing it, and that's what the uh, graph was about. That's got a whole bunch of equations behind those cells, and it's just trying different possibilities. Now, you mentioned a network analyzer you use for your testing. Yeah. Do you have the capability of measuring reflection on that network analyzer? It's a full, full 8410. Yeah, okay. So I, I know and I love those things. And so uh, did you look at the VSWR? The Absolutely, that's how it was tuned. Okay, oh, very good. What did you achieve? What he that? didn't mention, I think because he was trying to... Sure. You notice the cam had a metal plate on it with two hose clamps. That makes it adjustable for the spacing and then the length of the thing was set there with your clippers. Yeah. Very good. Mm -hmm. Now, does that spacing look right <coughs> from the end? Go to the table on the next page. Mm -hmm. Can you show text what I learned on? Let's see. Um, on the centimeters? On um, the What's the question? You, you grabbed this off of your spreadsheet. Yeah, thing. so what's the question? Um, 90 millimeters seems too long for yeah. one fourth of 21 centimeters. Well, it's one to guide. Yeah, you're in the way of guide. It's, yeah, yeah. it's in the way of guide. So it's, you're correcting for the guide wide length change. Okay. okay. Well, it sounds almost like you guys went through an empirical campaign and found the best spot. You did some calculation and then you cut and dry. Well, he, he did the calculations and then we built the thing <coughs> and made it tunable. Yeah. And it was remarkable how close it was. Oh, well, very good. We didn't actually have to trim the feed horn. The, feed horn. the coffee cans put, put together were basically just the right length. Very lucky. Nice. So. Science. Well done. Yeah. 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 friends with one of the instructors, they might find a place for it. Yeah. yeah. That's what roofs are for. Long penetrating roof models. <laughs> he already has a portable mod, just throw a bunch of balls. Yeah. Yeah. Alright. No Thank you. Thank you.